Word. Okay, let's turn our Bibles to the book of 2 Peter. And, uh, you know, we live in days where it can be hard to stand firm and grow for the Lord. There's so many things that try to pull us away. There's so many things that try to distract us. You know, I was reading on Facebook today, an article popped up, and uh, it's had five things that aren't really sins. Well, there's only one problem with the article. It has a lot of things that sounded nice and good, but there wasn't a single verse of scripture in it. And a lot of the things it was saying that were, weren't really sins, a few of the things were really sins, went against scripture, and uh, really lead people astray. But it's so easy to get twisted up in this world. How many people read that article and say, wow, I never knew that, I don't really have to do this, or I can't, I, you know, I don't need to go by what I always thought I should do. So many of us, we have to be so watchful and guard our faith. We need to guard our faith. We need to, how do we guard our faith? Do you stand like a soldier and stand guard against it? Go to the nearest prop store and buy a suit of armor? Is that how we guard our faith? Nope. We guard it by growing. guarded by growing, by seeking to become a stronger believer. None of us will ever be perfect, but we can always seek to draw closer to the Lord. So, as we start our reading in 2 Peter, this is a passage, this is a book that came to mind as Peter is addressing the church. We read in verse 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Christ Jesus, we start out, we can look at the attitude of Peter. What's the first thing he wants you to know about him? I'm not a big shot. I'm a servant. Yeah. The first thing isn't his title. It isn't, I'm an apostle. No. The first thing is, I'm a servant. I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. One of the first lessons I want us to take from this passage is humility. You want to grow in the Lord? You want to avoid falling? You know, we all have people we know, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we mourn over, that it's so sad to see them fall. The number one way to stop yourself from falling is first off, humility. That's what Peter has here. His first thing, before he's an apostle, he's a servant. And then he's writing this letter to those who have obtained like precious faith of us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So who's he writing this to? All of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior. He's writing this for us. Move on. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So first off, we read his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Is there anything that we need for life and godliness that we can't find in the words of God? It's all here. It's all here in what he's written. It's so important that we understand we don't need some big shot with a PhD in theology to come and tell us what God wants us to know. We have the Bible. The very words of God written down for us to understand. You know, when Christians start to drift, they start to fall, one of the first things they start to drift and fall away from is the dependence on God's word. They start to focus more on how they feel. They start to focus on more of what this teacher said, or what that book I wrote, I read, said. 
Books, books are fine. Teachers are fine. But God's word is preeminent. Anything that goes against God's word needs to be avoided like the plague. Because God's word has everything we need. God's word is everything we need for life and godliness. Look at verse 4. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, and through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, first off, what has he given us here? Promises. Exceedingly great and precious promises. What are some of those promises today? Home in heaven. Amen. A home in heaven. That he's uh, always with us. That he's always with us. What a blessing that is to know that you're never alone. That God's always with you. That's right. Forgiveness of our sins. No matter how bad our actions are, Jesus Christ has promised if we confess our sin, he'll faith, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a blessed promise that is. If you're like me and you're, and you're your own worst critic, that is a truly precious promise. We've been given so many great and precious promises, and then that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What does God want for us? Does he want us to fit right into the corruption that's in this world? We're sojourners anyway. He wants us to escape that corruption. Escape, yeah. He wants us to escape that corruption. The ideal Christian in the eyes of God isn't someone who goes to church on Sunday and lives like the devil Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's not what God's looking for. That's not what God wants for us. He doesn't want us to be in bondage to our lust. He wants us to be free. So how do we do that? In verse 5 we read, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence. So first off, this is what he's telling us to do. Giving all diligence. What does that mean to give our diligence? What does that to Not mean? Not half-heartedly. Yeah, first off, do this diligently. Not half-heartedly. Do this purposely. Pay purposefully. Mm -hmm. Pay attention. Be focused on this. Add to your faith virtue. So, okay, we have faith in Jesus Christ and we're saved. What, what do we do now? Add to our faith what? Virtue? What does that mean? What does that mean, class? Virtue is, you know, being a, a gracious, considerate, nice, uh, merciful. There's a lot into virtue. There's a lot of different things about virtue. Yeah. But in short, living a life of godliness, of godly character. We're not just looking at the Bible and saying, oh, that's nice stuff. Love your neighbor as yourself? Well, that's nice. Hey, there's my neighbor. He owes me five bucks. I'm going to knock his lights out. That's not virtue. Virtue is not me watching a pretty lady walk down the street and lusting after her. That's not virtue. Virtue is not uh, lying. It's not stealing. Add to our faith, first off, godly conduct. Yeah. Then we add to our virtue knowledge. Okay, we live our lives for the Lord, and then we add to that knowledge. Are you studying your Bible? When's the last time you open up God's Word? How else are we going to gain knowledge? And it's for by yourself, for yourself. Yeah. You know, for God. Yeah, you can gain knowledge coming to church and hearing a preacher, but that's only one... At most, we have four meetings a week. That's not a substitute. Read your Bibles. Study. Seek to have knowledge. 
any time we look in our life and say, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not really familiar with that passage of Scripture, that should be a red flag saying, I need to study that passage of Scripture. Because you know what Satan does when he finds out, oh, I'm not familiar with that? He licks his chops. He knows he's got a vulnerable point in your life. And Satan, he don't fight fair. He's not going for the place that you're really well studied in. He's not going to attack you at your strongest point. He'll attack you at your weakest point. He'll attack you at your most vulnerable point. We add that knowledge so we don't have as many vulnerable points. To knowledge, self-control. Self-control. I don't necessarily have to do everything I feel like doing. Just because I feel like doing it doesn't mean it's worth doing. Doesn't mean I should do it. My feelings are not in control of me. You know, feelings can come from a few different sources. Some feelings can be given to us by God, but others can be given to us from a far more nefarious source. Others can come straight from the pit of hell. Just because I feel something doesn't mean I should do it. Self-control. As Christians, we need to be people who are in control of our emotions. You know, the world likes to say, follow your heart. <sighs> no, we need to follow the Lord. And you go with the scripture, the heart is wicked. Yes. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yes, the Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. It totally goes against the Bible. Yes. Don't fall for the world's trap. Self-control. It's so important. So that self-control, perseverance, one thing that oftentimes destroys believers is they don't have perseverance. Sometimes you've got to pray for that loved one that's lost for years. Sometimes you have to do that. I've heard of stories where Someone was praying for their loved one for decades. And they finally repented. Perseverance. You know, God doesn't force people to just accept him. He gives everyone a choice, and some people are stubborn and bullheaded. You're praying and you're praying. Just because they haven't repented yet doesn't mean God isn't working. It doesn't mean God isn't convicting their heart. Just because you're desperate, you need this job. Doesn't mean that God isn't working because you don't have it yet. It might just mean God's preparing the right job for your situation. Perseverance. Be patient. Let's just don't be, well, I prayed last week. It didn't happen, so who cares about God? He, he wasn't there. not be like that. I've seen so many people fall away from the Lord because they don't have perseverance. They're not patient. When you're going through trials, when you're going through hardship, God wants us to persevere through those. Sometimes trials are the best thing for us. What does the book of James say about trials? So we've been studying James. Hang up here tonight. Faith, work, and patience. Yes. And that carries on. Trials can be a good thing for us. Sometimes God allows trials to come into our life because he knows we'll grow through them. We'll be stronger. I can look at some of the most horrible trials in my life and looking back at them, be thankful that God brought me through them. Perseverance through those trials helped me to learn. Helped me to it's grow. always after the trial. It's yeah. never during the trial. Perseverance is what we need during the trial. Yeah. Afterwards, you can look back and see where God, where God prospered. You for it. Be godly. God wants us to be holy. What does it mean for us to be holy? Separated from the world. Without spot and blemish, without any faults at all, which we're never going to get there till we get to heaven. You know, there's some people in the world that live pretty good lives. Some people in the world manage to have some virtue to them. Yes, they do. 
we're not called to just stop a virtue. We're called to literally be set apart. People should be able to look at you and be able to tell that you're a Christian. Even if you don't open your mouth and say a word, people should be able, if they watch you for a little while, they should know, they should see it. Because you're living a life that's set apart for the Lord. It shouldn't be a shock if one of you tells someone, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus. They shouldn't be, really? I never would have expected that. I remember visiting a church one time and seeing a guy from work there, and I felt I did feel bad that I accidentally said it out loud, but it was just such a shock to see him. I'm surprised to see you here. This kind of popped out of my mouth because I was so shocked to see the guy. He's a scoundrel at work. But there he is, a core member of the church that he is a part of. <laughs> uh, it shouldn't be like that. Secret agent Christian, no. It should be so obvious that we are set apart, holy, that we're living for the Lord. I shouldn't have to guess. Your family, your friends, your loved ones, even your enemies. They should all know, even if they despise you. Yeah, I don't like... I don't like Andrea, but I know she's a godly woman. I don't like Jeff, but I know he's a godly man. It should be obvious, because we're set apart and holy. Do you have that reputation in your life, from the people around you? The way to change that is to strive to be set apart. Verse 7, we want to have brotherly kindness. You know, the body of Christ is a family, one body. But it strikes me as so shocking how cold members of the body of Christ can be to one another sometimes. You know, sometimes we're in the body of Christ and people shun each other, don't talk to each other. Or they're friends to each other's face and behind their back, they're bad-mouthing them. That shouldn't be. We're supposed to be kind to one another. Brotherly kindness. Kindness as in like family to each other. Is that how you treat each other? You know, strong believers also have strong believers backing them, praying for them, fighting for them. And this is the root of it here. When you come to the body of Christ, you're with people who you know have your back, who are praying for you, who are supporting you. so important for our growth is our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. God called none of us to be an island. And then to brotherly kindness, love. Who are we called to love? Everyone. Everyone. If you don't love everyone in this room, then I'm going to tell you something. You have a problem. Because the Bible commands it. Read 1 Corinthians. Religion is in vain. We are all commanded to love one another. That is so important. That is so vital. You know, we get caught up with what the world talks about. The world cheapens love to say it's just a feeling. But no. Love is a choice. What are you going to do for each other? Are you going to be there for each other in their time of need? Are you going to be there for your brother and sister in Christ when it's inconvenient? God wants us to love one another, love people. It's hard to drift away. It's much harder to drift away from the Lord when you love your brothers and sisters in Christ because oftentimes your love for them will keep you from drifting away. I know that in my own life when I've been discouraged and downtrodden and hurt, but it's been my love for the body of Christ that's pulled me back. Because even when I'm struggling and I'm hurting, I know if I draw away, I'm going to be hurting other people. And that gets me to go back to God and get things right with Him and get where God wants me to be. 
do you love each other? We read in verse 8, For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This isn't a you might not be. This is a you will not be. You won't be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? You won't be barren or unfruitful. It means you'll have fruit. Elisha show fruit. Yeah. You're not going to go through in your Christian life and see that you've had no impact on anyone else. That you're not growing that you're, you're just kind of there. No. You'll see an impact in your life. You'll see an impact in the lives of people around you. You'll make a difference in people's lives. You'll see the growth in your own life if you do these things. This isn't a you might see this. It's a you will see this. That's a promise of the Lord. You know, oftentimes when we don't grow, we look at the wrong person as a culprit. We can blame it on other people. We can blame it on the pastor on the church. And yeah, if the church just doesn't teach any scripture or, you know, you might not be growing or... But oftentimes the first thing is we need to be looking at ourselves. Maybe I'm not growing because I'm too self-centered. Maybe I'm not growing because I'm not applying. Maybe I'm like the person who wants to build muscle but never lifts weights, never does any exercise. How good am I going to do at building muscle? You know? I went to work this week with a very important goal. I had so much product in my freezer, I wanted to get it rid of it. I wanted to clear it out. Well, would I have cleared out that product by just showing up to work and not trying to move any of it to the shelf? <laughs> what would it have been? Unfruitful. Barren. I had to do more than just show up. I had to actually do something. So many of us in our walks with the Lord, so many Christians, we get the idea that as long as we show up at church on Sunday, it doesn't matter if we ever apply the scripture to our life. We just got to show up. We can live like the. We can treat each other like dirt Monday through Saturday. We can be the biggest gossips on the planet. But if we show up at church, good. Yeah, church is important. The Bible says be there. Hebrews 10 25. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But if that's the only thing you've got and you're not working on these other things, you will be unprofitable. You will be barren. You will be unfruitful. You won't grow in your knowledge and love for the Lord. I don't care if the Apostle Paul is has come back from the dead to be the pastor of your church. You're not going to grow. Verse 9, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. What happens to us if we choose to ignore these things? We become as we were before Christ. We backslide. We fall. The thing we have to understand is none of us are immune from this. I remember in high school, a deacon at my church was meeting with me regularly for Bible studies. Someone I had a great deal of respect for. You know, he fell into alcoholism. I would have never expected it. I would have fought on a list of people least likely to backslide. I would have put him at the top of the list of people least likely to backslide. But he did. None of us are immune. Be diligent. Verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. You will never stumble. Isn't it great that God's word gives us a... Uh, you do this, you won't fall. 
Isn't that great? Yeah. Amen. The thing is applying it. Because there's... It's really not rocket science. It's easier to say it, though, than it is to apply it. It means that I can't be the captain of my own ship. That it can't be what I want all the time. That I can't be led by my feelings. It means I have to be committed to letting Jesus Christ run my life. But if we do these things, the Bible says you will never stumble. And I can say in my life, I have never seen a believer who is doing all these things stumble. Never have. That's a choice. That is a very important choice. And my reason for sharing this with you isn't to... isn't because, oh no, you guys are all a hair's breath away from backsliding. But my reason for sharing this is because this is what God's putting on my heart. Do you know how many of his children he wants to see stumble and fall? Zero, that's right, Larry. Not a single one. All too often as Christians, we forget that Satan is out there. That Satan is real. That Satan is gunning for each and every one of you. We let our guards down. We need to stay on guard in this world, this dark, difficult, harsh world. You can't even turn on Christian radio or go into the Christian bookstore without running into false teachers. Are we going to be people who stand for Jesus? Or are you going to roll the dice? Say, yeah, I don't need to do all that. I can, I'll be good. I'll make it. Because if we choose to say, yeah, you know, I like the self-control part, but the knowledge part, yeah, that's a lot of effort to read my Bible. Well, Satan will target your lack of knowledge. If you love reading your Bible, but you don't really want to practice self-control, well, Satan will target that. My hope and prayer today is that none of us will leave any open spot. That none of us will let our guards down. God has wonderful plans for each and every one of us. If we don't experience those wonderful plans that God has for us, that's not because God let drop the ball. That's because we choose to not follow his plan. I hope and pray that we will stand steadfast. I hope and pray that we will take heed. As God's promised here, if you do these things, you will never stumble. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us and that while we were yet sinners, you died on the cross for our sins, Lord. You paid the price for our transgressions. Lord, I'm so thankful that you have in your word answers to how we can stand against the attacks of the enemy. Your word tells us if we do these things, we will not stumble. That's a promise. In your word, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be arrogant, that we wouldn't be overconfident, that we wouldn't sit back and say, well, I can do it my way because I won't fall. I don't need to do all that. Help us instead trust your word to do things your way, to follow the things that you laid out, Lord. Satan is a difficult foe. He's a dangerous foe. 
but he's a limited foe. He can only do so much if we choose to stand on your word. He cannot defeat us, and we're so thankful for that, Lord. Guide and direct us, I pray, Lord. Help us to apply your word to our heart, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.